Thank you for coming all the way from the main conference center to, to hear this talk. And uh, this is actually a forehand talk with Simon, my colleague, who's uh, here, probably, is, is traveling. So, um, but anyway, I was there, like, I, I knew I had to speak myself. So um, I'm talking about PostgreSQL and PostGIS, which uh, I assume you already know broadly, but I'll do a, a brief introduction anyway. Uh, the first question I was to ask you, uh, actually I want to answer the, the question, why should I use a database first? Because not everybody uses a database. And the reason is uh, quite simple. You don't want to reinvent a wheel. It's been 40 years that people ask themselves, how do I store my information on the computer? And then they come up with that, uh, a list of clever ideas. And uh, the database happens to be uh, very similar to the way we think about problems. So we usually think about transactions. So we have to do like 10 changes and we want all of them to happen. Or if one fails, we want all of them to not happen. We don't want to leave things halfway through. Um, we want things to happen concurrently. In modern times, we've got more than one computer. Uh, Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, he estimated the market of 12 computers around the world when he started. But <laughs> things have evolved quite differently. So uh, in any system, you have one server and lots of clients that do work at the same time. So you want a system that's able to do that without making a mess, which is called concurrency. And the database uh, is uh, modeled on set theory. That's, that's where the relational world comes, uh, uh, which is very natural, uh, uh, apart from the fact that it's taught at primary school. But it's the way we think about things. We have a set of things and then we take one of them or we take two of them or we take all the things here that match the things there. So it's not an exotic way of thinking. It's just how we would think even if we didn't have databases. And uh, the founder of relational databases theory is Edgar Codd, who said that these are the three main features why you would, have, you would use a database rather than store your information on text files or find other ways of cumbersome ways of recording them. You want data integrity, so you want your data to be without uh, inconsistencies. So uh, you want precision in the sense you want to, to you want to have an exact answer when you ask your database whether you've got one information or not, and uh, you want to have a logical model. So you don't want to, to think about files, bytes, and uh, four byte here, two bytes there. You want to think about logical objects like numbers, strings, uh, shapes, uh, points, uh, features. So you think about the logical model. When your system evolves and it provides the same logical model with the more performant uh, storage, you don't have to change anything because you're not tied to a particular implementation. Now, why PostgreSQL then? Because it's a relational database. It, it, it's already a good reason by itself. But it is free, both as a beer and a speech. Uh, I'm not sure that free beer goes well with free speech, but <laughs> surely it goes well to speak <laughs> freely. But uh, and also, it's required by PostGIS. So I'm sure you all want PostGIS. And uh, if you want PostGIS, you have to have PostGIS anyway, because it's like uh, you, I, I want uh, a, a car and I need the wheels. Um, it's robust and reliable. It's been developed for 27 years now. So it's probably older than somebody in this room. And it's got a big community. Um, not me, unfortunately. It's got a big community. Uh, there are lots of Postgres-only conferences. So not conferences where they talk about everything and then there's somebody that talks about Postgres. But Postgres thematic conferences, this year uh, I can count these. There are more probably. I didn't do sort of an inventory. So it's you, you won't be left alone if you use Postgres. Now, it's also advanced technology when you use Postgres because there are lots of uh, new releases that are not like the same old stuff uh, cooked again or rebranded with a different name. It's just new releases that happen regularly with new features that weren't available before. And that's just a selected list of new features uh, with releases and dates. So for instance, the latest release is like 9th of uh, September. So it's probably 11 days or <coughs> 10. Uh, what's the date? Uh, anyway, 10 days. And they've got all these things here that are Many of them are standard SQL. Many of them, some of them are Postgres only. Some of them are not Postgres only, but very clever. Some of them are very welcomed by web developers and so on. But this is just a, a um, quick overview. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that what we did before September 2010 is rubbish. It's just that this is not a list of features. It's a way of telling you Postgres is evolving and it's compl it's ev every year is better. And it's regular, even if it's open source, uh, uh, but I it's got, I it's like clockwork. See, every year you get a new release. So it's, it's not like, uh, wait, you already know that if you have a new feature that's not here, but it's been developed, if it's ready by December, we know it will be probably September 2014, because we already know that this is sort of yearly plan laid out. Now, to optimize queries, we use indexes. Uh, I'll be moving slightly quickly, because I have 20 minutes. Um, an index is, some is a way to optimize a database. So you do the same thing in equi equivalently, but faster. And it's a, it's a persistent structure, which is on disk. So you mean you have your data, and then you add an index. And this provides uh, an optimal access to a particular table for a particular kind of query. So it, it's not like a generic thing. You know, I, I create an index, and everything is faster. No, I, created, I create an index on purpose for a particular way of reading the data, and the in index helps there. It depends on what data type you're using and what operators you're using. So you can optimize computing the area of the surface, seeing whether a point is included in a particular region, or this kind of things. Not all indexes are covered by this short presentation. We talk about spatial indexes, so indexes that are related to things that go with maps and uh, mapping and, and all these things. In co currently in Postgres, there are two different kinds of spatial indexes. GIST, which probably is not unknown in this room, and SPGist, which is similar to GIST, but it's space partitioned. This is very recent. Uh, even the theory is recent. And uh, it's, uh, it's got advantages and disadvantages that we will discuss. So if you do spatial things with Postgres, you will you'll be using lots of GIST and some, GIST, uh, uh, some SPGist as well. Uh, in Postgres, you've got uh, spatial data types. You've got some legacy spatial data types that uh, were developed in the, in the 90s. So, uh, and then you've got PostGIS, which is the standard one, the official one. So the difference is that uh, uh, this, is, uh, this supports geometry and geography. So you have the idea of uh, globe, special uh, reference systems, and all the, all the things that you, you know probably better than me. Um, this supports less index types. SPGist has been developed. I, I couldn't get in the room at 2 o'clock, so I don't know if, it, if that was mentioned. But it was include, it, they thought to include this in 2.1, and then they had to postpone it. But it's, it's been developed. Um, so we can use the basic uh, Postgres data types for uh, simple calculations, or use PostGIST data types to have professional spatial data. It's an extension, so it can be installed very quickly. It, it Two minutes, really. I'm not joking. It's really two minutes, if you, if you, unless you have an exotic operating system with a complicated hardware. And then, oops. So we will use both of them, because we want to demonstrate how indexes work. So um, the, the goal of this talk is not just to talk about things, but it's to show you explicit examples where indexes help in optimizing these queries. Um, what is spatial data? You've got two-dimensional points, segments, paths, cubes, polygons, all, all, all the shapes. But uh, the idea is that um, you can represent any even three-dimensional shapes. I think there was a talk this morning with, uh, which I, could make, I wouldn't make, uh, unfortunately, explaining what uh, 3D features are available in PostGIS. We, we won't cover 3D in this talk. Uh, we were just covering 2D. And uh, these two t uh, index types are uh, overlapping. You can use both of them in some cases. They have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, GIST is, the, is more flexible, but it has to be balanced, which means it's more expensive to maintain. So when you write things, uh, the database takes extra work in order to keep the tree balanced. SPGist is not balanced, so it's faster, but it doesn't support uh, circles or rivers or complicated things. It just supports points and boxes. So if you happen to have simple computations like what points are in this rectangle, then you can use these. But if you have to 
intersect uh, council uh, with another district, you probably need to use GIST. Um, a database is a system where you type your queries and then they are executed. So you need to be able to specify things in uh, using uh, your keyboard. So uh, you have, uh, you, you can't use fancy graphic characters. You need to, s to write everything in ASCII. So there are some symbols that have been put together by the PostGIS and PostGIS users to represent these notions. So for instance, if you want to say that something is at the left of something else, you use double uh, less than. If you want to say that something intersects something else, you use the double ampersand and so on. Every symbol has a geometric significance that you can use when you type your query. We'll, we'll see actually the query in a few seconds. So you can see there's all, all the, the things you need really because you, you can see whether two things are e equivalent, equal actually. So if you have, if they have the same shape, even if it's written slightly different. So if you start from here or if you start from here, it's the same shape but it's written differently. Or you can say this thing is a subset. See, this sort of uh, ice cream is actually the best, the best possible attempt to emulate the mathematical symbol of one set is inside another one. They, they, they were quite fun. It was creative. It was <laughs> I wouldn't have done better. Um, OK, so let's go into examples, which is clear. So if you have a large number of 2D shapes and one point, we want to find all the shapes that contain that particular point. So this is a concrete problem. Uh, large number is I, I, I generated randomly data because what, you, what happens is that real life data is either, either protected by uh, complications or too small to do meaningful examples because these databases happen to be very quick. So if you want to demonstrate these things, you need to have millions of records. Otherwise, it's instantaneous. So I generated randomly one million shapes and one million points for, for the examples. We obviously, you can generate more than one million, but this is enough to see the difference significantly. So this is our problem. And uh, this is how you solve it in SQL, in PostgreSQL with PostGIS. So you, this part here is called CTE. It's just uh, you create a, s a sort of a table called P, which contains the result of this query here, which is actually the point that we selected. Remember, we, we have one point we selected. And then we select all the shapes such that the shape intersects the point. It's quite readable and uh, it's also efficient. That, that's a good thing. So if you, if you run a normal query, sorry for the, for the characters, but that's the actual output you get. But I'll, I'll, I'll point you to the relevant parts. So this is, what, this is what happens when you ask Postgres to execute the query and tell you the timing and the number of rows obtained at every step of the computation. So uh, the table of shapes is uh, scanned sequentially. So starts from first one, second one, third one, eh? one million times. It returns one million rows and it takes 276 milliseconds, which is fast, but it's not fast in, in our problem. Because if you had to do it like 1,000 times, it's not fast. Then you have, yes, you have your point, And then uh, um, at s what you do here, you have the join filter which puts together the point and the shapes and removes all the points that do not uh, touch that particular shape. Sorry, all the shapes that do not contain that particular point. So see, we start with one million shapes, we throw away 997,000 and we keep all of them and it takes one second roughly to do that. If we use an index, what happens? It's totally different. The result is the same, because it's the same query, otherwise it would be a bug. But what happens is that uh, when reading the shapes, it's an index is used. So the index only produces 5,800 rows. So it throws away all uh, rows uh, but 5%. And then uh, you, uh, after having eliminated 99.5% of the candidates, the remaining candidates are examined, 
with the recheck. And uh, the final result is that 2,700 like before. But the total time is now 53 milliseconds. So it's 20 times faster. It's not magic. It's just that uh, instead of looking at one million things, we throw away almost all of them and we look only at 5,000. That's why it's faster. Second example, uh, we have loads of points and one single shape. So we do the opposite. We have all these points. We have a shape. What points are inside that particular shape? It looks like a you know, high school problem, but it's most of the, most of the problems you, you, fi you face when you do actual uh, geographical work are of this kind. So find all people uh, that have to pay a particular council tax because they live in a particular area or so on. So how would that prob problem would be solved in PostgreSQL and PostGIS? Same thing, we select one shape here. Uh, this is a variable, so it means I select the shape I want, and then it picks up one shape from the bag of all shapes, and then it selects all the points that intersect that shape. Very, if you get used to it, it's very readable. And that's what happens without gist. Again, you have another sequential scan, so you have one million rows that are fetched in 233 milliseconds. Then you have uh, a operation of a uh, filter that removes <coughs> lots of them <coughs> and then at the end you only have 90 of them so see I it's really a waste you pick one million pieces of paper and then you you read all of them and then you throw away all of them except 90 no wonder it takes uh, one second so it takes only 230 milliseconds to read them but then to examine all of them it takes most of the time when you have an index what happens is that the index can uh, throw away all the ones that are surely unneeded and then recheck only the ones that might or might not be needed and so you can see the big difference here you got uh, uh, the index only selects less than 1000 and it does so in less than one millisecond so the final uh, output after all the computation the recheck so you have 700 and, you, and then you find the real 90 by a second examination, but in the end you could do six milliseconds. So you see the, how relevant are these techniques. And this means that you don't need to know, you don't need to be clever in analyzing your data. It's already factored inside the database engine. So you don't have to write an algorithm. You just ask for what you want and then the database will find out an efficient way of answering your question. Now, a third example is a bit uh, edgy. It's the same example, but we pick uh, on purpose an unlucky shape. What does it mean, unlucky? Uh, I haven't gone into details, but as many of you will probably know, the way indexes work, they replace complicated shapes by a rectangle. And they do the computations on the rectangle, which is easier. Checking if one point is inside a complicated shape is a huge computation. Checking if it's inside the rectangle is very easy. You just <coughs> go, is x between the x's and is y between? Yes, then it's in the rectangle. Now, um, if your shape is a rectangle, this is perfect. If your shape is uh, not a rectangle, you will find some points that are not really useful, but they, they are inside the rectangle, but not inside the shape. And that's why in the recheck procedure, you throw away most of them, because they are the ones in the rectangle and these, one are, are these ones are the ones that are in the actual shape you require. Now, the weak uh, case of these uh, indexes is when the shape is, has an area which is very small compared to the rectangle. And, and, and so uh, we'll show now a, a difficult case. So this is with gist. We don't do without gist because you already know that indexes are important. So what happens with the index? Uh, the index is used. It fetches uh, 57 rows, but because it's thrown away 5,300 5, of them. So you can say that this index will uh, take only one uh, row every, um, what was that, 2,000, 200? One row every 200 of one million, but still most of them are, are have to be eliminated afterwards. So it's sort of a weak case. And uh, I'll, I have a picture I'd like to show you which is already here. 
Um, oh, yeah. The only thing, this is a bit, yeah. Not the best uh, size of the window. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. so this is our shape, which is thin. In the sense of, uh, if you if you consider the rectangle is much bigger than the shape. When you do the rectangle stuff, you get all these points here. See, you get lots of points you don't, you don't really have to get. But when you recheck, you select only the points that are actually needed. So this is the 90, and this is the, the 5,000. So this is a, 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 a weak point. And uh, the last slide will show about uh, what, what happens with the box. Because we can use SPGs only with the box. It's sort of limited so far. Um, what you can see is that uh, this is the index that we know GIST. It takes about 8 milliseconds and it does its job. And SPGIST gives the same time. So it's, a, it's equivalent in this particular case. Uh, but the thing about SPGIST is that it's much more efficient because it's unbalanced. <coughs> so it, it's low maintenance. So this, uh, this last slide shows you that this uh, type of index, even if it's still experimental, because it's not into post GIS yet, it's it's very powerful. Okay, so uh, thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. <coughs> uh, the SPGIS uh, index when uh, will be in the post GIS? It will support only the point uh, against the box, or it support only line and other feature against the box? No, uh, the SP index is based on the idea that uh, you divide the space in partitions, and then the subtree is only contained in the partition. So it cannot support things that are not points. So it's because limited. it's either here or in the other one. It can't be across them. So it's limited, it's to, limited point. to points, mm -hmm. but the fact that so far it's a point in a box, and I think it's, it's not possible to generalize to a point in a circle, yeah. because it has to go to the, po to the, it has to do the recheck anyway. Yeah. And I think it will be in the next post GIS, because it was, was supposed to be, and it was postponed a few months ago. Um, not Any other questions? Thank you.